What's up, everybody? Welcome into another edition of the BearCast on Sikkim365.com. I'm Craig Smoke, Sikkim365.com team reporter. Uh, also, Sikkim365 radio host weekdays 3 until 6. Joined, as always, by Grayson Grudenhafer, director of broadcasting, also team and recruiting reporter for Sikkim365. We're brought to you by Burt Colchin Ford. There's no better way to tailgate than with the Ford from BK, also brought to you by WellMed Medical Management and USMD Health System Dallas. Hopefully you're having a good week. Uh, it's been very busy in terms of Baylor sports news. You've got the NBA draft upon us uh, here in a few weeks. Davion Mitchell waiting to hear his name called and some other questions to be answered. Uh, we were just kind of discussing before the podcast. Jared Butler still is not you know, publicly declared for the draft, um, so that's still a storyline to be watching. Um, you've got Freddie Gillespie doing his thing in the NBA with the Toronto Raptors. You've got Mark Vital, uh, as we'll talk about. Uh, he's getting ready for a pro basketball career, but uh, interesting NFL note with him, Grayson. And uh, we've got, of course, recruiting and uh, spring sports all still going on for the most part as well. So let's dive right in and uh, let's start talking uh, recruiting. Uh, a new commit since we spoke last week. And a uh, nice little run last week with a couple new names to add to the mix for this uh, class of 2022. And uh, Grayson Richard Reese, the latest addition. We had him on Sikkim 365 uh, radio last week uh, to talk about his commitment the day after. And uh, he is the newest commit for Baylor football. So uh, Richard Reese, uh, the latest. And what can you tell us about him? Yeah, so Richard, of course, got the offer and then committed two days after. He's out of Belleville High School. He's a guy who uh, kind of just popped on the radar really quickly and then, of course, made his decision really quickly. So Houston Baptist, Texas State were his only other two offers. Uh, about 5'10", 175 pounds. So not the biggest running back, um, but definitely one who, when you watch his film, runs extremely hard and is able to get downhill extremely quickly, which is something the Baylor staff has really, really been looking for out of the running back position. I know you and I have talked about this before, and I feel like everyone kept asking me, why is Baylor taking a running back or not believing that Baylor is going to take a running back in this class? And, you know, for the longest time, just for whatever reason, Baylor felt like they needed to take one. And I think a big part of that is seeing what they had on campus and saying, you know what, I think – I think we need to upgrade. I think we can add more depth there and add more talent at the running back position. We know Jeff Grimes is a guy who wants to run the football. Uh, saw Tyler Algier have a monster year for BYU a year ago, but I think if you look at Baylor's roster, it's probably going to be more of a committee um, than it was at BYU last season. So anyways, I think that's the direction that it's going. So Richard kind of fits that mold back-to-back uh, to back. Uh, 4A offensive MVP for his district. Um, this is a, just a crazy stat, but 454 carries for 3,869 yards and 49 touchdowns over the last two seasons on the ground. So extremely productive. Uh, like I said, I think when you watch his film, the thing that sticks out is how quickly he gets downhill. I know some people compared him to Steve Slayton, a guy who played at West Virginia. They also wear the same number, which I think also makes that comparison a little more fun. But, um, yeah, I think this is a nice pickup for this class. I think he fits exactly what they want and highly productive, which you love to see out of the high school prospects. And also, I think if you look at the film, you can see the speed and athleticism is there, even though he does not have, uh, you know, official testing times right now. I do believe when he goes to camps this summer, uh, we'll see how many he ends up going to. I think he's going to be one who draws a lot of attention because – I mean, the simple fact is if you turn on his film and then you tell me he runs a, you know, hand-timed four fours, I mean, I, he's going to get a ton of offers and he's going to be a guy who I think will quickly ascend uh, in the 2022 class. So uh, nearly 4,000 yards over the last two seasons, well over 4,000 yards uh, in the last three seasons uh, since, you know, jumping out onto the scene as a, as a freshman. So now preparing for his senior year, um, sounds like anything less than like a couple thousand yards will be a disappointment for Richard Reese, but uh, bell cow out of Belleville is what he is. Uh, and not like a bell cow in terms of big physical, you know, Craig Ironhead Hayward, just lots of carries, lots and lots of carries and lots of yards for 
Richard Reese. So he is commit number 11 for the class of 2022. And um, the only running back commit and probably will be the only running back commit in this entire class. So that tells you what you need to know about Richard Reese and how they view him is that they're not really, uh, from what we can gather, looking to, to add too much more to the backfield. So, you know, only one guy, you're you must like that guy a whole heck of a lot to, to make him the guy. So, um, yeah, Richard yeah, and Reese. You, and you have Jordan Jenkins coming in. Too. Right. So, I mean, they, they are building depth there, but you're exactly right. I mean, you're only taking one, so you got to like the guy that you're bringing in. And I know that was a big thing. They were looking for their guy. This staff was looking for their guy at running back. I know there were a few guys that they had offered who they liked, but I, there were two ways it was swinging. The top guys, just they didn't feel like they had a shot with. And then the guys who they were kind of on the fringe, like, do we really want to take this guy, if you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. Richard kind of finally fell in that category. They found the guy they wanted. And, uh, yeah, I, I think they're done at the running back position. I mentioned to you on Friday, I do believe that, obviously, if there is a running back who they think could play linebacker, could play another position, I, I do think they could still take one uh, if it goes that way. Um, but I don't think they're going to take another true running back. So if there's another Abram Smith out there, then uh, maybe they're interested in you. If not, then uh, Richard Reese is the lone running back for this Baylor class. So you've got uh, your running back. You've got two tight ends in Kelsey Johnson and Cody Mladinka. You've got three offensive linemen for the time being and Timothy Don, Colton Price, and Bryce Simpson, who uh, just joined the class what, last week. Uh, and... Then uh, elsewhere on offense, you've got your quarterback in Zach Pyron. And no receivers right now. Uh, that's a position that we talked about on Friday will, you know, be one to, to be following along with. That's certainly, you know, not an area they're going to completely ignore. They're going to add some guys, but just not taking shape just yet. Uh, so outside of wide receiver on offense, you pretty much hit on every other position, uh, including quarterback in Zach Pyron, uh, Grayson. I guess uh, lead 11 stuff is happening again, which – uh, is kind of strange because like there's a lot of stuff that's back now that I'm sort of like oh yeah we didn't have that last year or it's just like it's just strange that there's a lot going on because I'm so used to there not being a lot going on now right so uh, we are getting used to the camps being back and travel and, and all that stuff so uh Zach Pyron, uh, I saw one tweet from a recruiting analyst didn't spell his name right which is a little bit concerning yeah. but uh you know, outside of that, um, he did have nice things to say about Zach Pyre and said he was a little bit underrated uh, for where they had him. I think it was a two four seven guy. Uh, so, uh, what what did he do this past weekend to get people chattering? Yeah, so Zach Pyron competed in the Elite Eleven Regional in Nashville. Of course, this is a huge event. Uh, these events have been going on for I think the past month now in various cities. I know Dallas and Houston both had. A regional as well and of course the goal of this event is to get an invite into the elite 11 finals i believe they take 22 guys now to go to the finals and compete and then of course after that competition you have your elite 11 and so that that's kind of what the the camp situation is like so he went to this camp he measured six three get this 218 pounds oh wow he is bigger than kyron drones was at this <laughs> time in his career by actually by eight pounds, a significant margin. So um, really big kid. I actually talked to him a little bit about it. And I was like, man, you're going to be 225 pounds when you show up uh, for, for high school ball. I mean, you're going to be running QB power and scoring 20 touchdowns this year. And he said, no, 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 I'm trying to keep my weight where it's at. When I get to Baylor's when I'll get up to 225. So I think he's going to be right around that 218 mark for a while now. So don't expect him to, to continue blowing up and being, you know, 235 when he gets on campus or anything like that. So 218, he ran a 4840, 34-inch vertical. So uh, really nice measurables there. He he was a little, uh, felt like he should have ran in the four sevens. I think that's his normal time. But uh, he competed really well. And I think everything you saw on Twitter, everything you've heard from the event, is that everyone came away very impressed with him. I know a couple of the 247 guys had him as the second quarterback at the camp behind Ty Simpson, who, of course, is the five-star commit to Alabama. Very, very good player. Very good player. I mean, you turn on the film, Ty Simpson is phenomenal. And, I mean, uh, I you know, I cover Baylor, but Ty Simpson, Baylor would have taken Ty Simpson 
<laughs> a million times out of a million times. So uh, a very, very good player there. But Pyron, according to many of these guys, right there with him. He showed, uh, according to Greg Biggins, who is the guy you talked about, um, he had this to say about the camp, and this is firsthand experience. A live, accurate arm, ball jumps off his hand, able to ro roll out, throw from different arm angles, um, and seem to get stronger as the camp went on. So very, very nice compliments there. I think when you hear those things, uh, it, it reminds me a lot of kind of the things that people were scared of with Josh Allen when he went to the NFL, but he's been able to obviously correct those and turn into a very good quarterback. Um, but just kind of that, that feel that I'm getting from Ty Simpson with his size reminds me a little bit of Josh Allen. I'm not sure he has the same arm as far as, you know, Josh Allen could probably throw the ball 110 yards yeah. on the run. Um, but I, I do think that Pyron does have the ability to get the ball out there. You know, I think he's probably got a 75-yard arm, which is still insane. So very good weekend for him. Everyone's talking about his ranking rising. And please tell me it does, because right now he's an 85 three-star. Um, I have had him right around that 88 mark, which would be a high three-star. So a huge gap there. Um and I think that's where he fits in right now. Somewhere between 87 and 89 is probably where I would have him, and I'm sure that's where 247 will probably be moving him. Yeah, and I would think, um, you know, we're in this country right now, we're dealing with a lot of, like, log jams and supply lines, and, like, everything's just trying to get back to uh, – I keep I hate saying keep getting back to normal, but, like, everybody's trying to, like, get everything, like, kind of unwound from the last year and, you know, like, straightened out and, and things like that. Um, and so like supply chains are messed up right now and it's taking longer for stuff to get places cause it's like backed up and yada, yada, yada point being, um, I think that the, uh, recruiting rankings right now are absolute bupkis, uh, in, in so many ways because nobody's seen anybody like, you know, you can go off high school tape last year, but we know those rankings are normally compiled of a lot more than just high school tape. It's especially those camps. And so, I think, you know, if we don't see some type of massive shakeup in rankings, then either all of those guys are just so tremendous at their jobs that they never really needed camps to rank guys, uh, which we know is not true, or there's about to be some massive changes in some of these rankings and, and guys like shooting up or, you know, maybe moving down, what have you. But, uh, yeah, it wouldn't be surprising at all because, I mean, they – you know, like, I'm not trying to harp on this, but don't even know how to spell the guy's name. And, you know, he's a bather come in, whatever. They're not real relevant right now kind of a deal. But, you know, that's great that he had a good showing. And hopefully it, it opens some eyes and uh, gets him the ranking that, you know, he deserves, whatever that may be. Uh, a shade above what he is right now, right where he is, or a much, much higher than he is. But regardless, uh, yeah, these, these rankings are about to get shaken up a little bit. Um, yeah, they will. As people get to see these guys in person, you're yeah. exactly right. They for sure will. Um, you know, if you watch film, that only does so much. You do need to see guys in person a lot of times to get the full picture. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I do think the ranking shifts are coming, and hopefully uh, these guys stand true to their word and, and give Pyron what he kind of earned um, over the weekend. And I'm very curious to see if he does get the Elite 11 invite. That would be huge for him. It'd be huge for... Baylor, it'd be huge for his ranking, of course. So uh, I, I think he should be, he should know that in the next week or so, whether he's going to get that invite or not. All right. So Zach Pyron, Baylor quarterback commit, uh, doing well in Nashville this past weekend. And we will see on the Elite 11 invite. Of course, Kyron Drones was a part of that. Uh, Gary Bohannon was a part of that. Jared Stidham was a part of that. Um, probably forgetting a quarterback or two. Zeno. Yeah, Zeno was a yeah. part of that. So um, if not, abnormal for Baylor quarterbacks to be involved, but uh, uh, it would certainly be cool to see Zach Pyron get in the mix. Um, elsewhere, uh, interesting note that was dropped yesterday. We had Nick Eatman on the show from DallasCowboys.com. He's covered the Cowboys for a really long time, and uh, he just happened to bring it up, uh, this, this note, and turns out that Smokey had caught wind of this as well a couple of weeks ago, and I, I guess just... Um, because really they weren't practicing until this you know past week there wasn't much reason to bring it up or really know for sure but Mark Vidal worked out for the Cowboys uh Baylor basketball standout uh was not like the lone invite to come up there or anything like that you know it wasn't some special priority but Jerry Jones apparently you know had his interest peaked much like he did with Rico Gathers and he just kind of has this fascination with you know basketball guys becoming football players and freaky athletes and things like that so anyways 
you know, apparently people over there in Dallas were impressed enough to bring in Mark for a workout. Um, Mark apparently was raving about how much he wants to be in the NBA. Um, so, uh, I mean, I don't know how much we'll say or anything, but I'm pretty sure he got like a good offer and uh, would be making better money than probably everybody listening to this podcast for the most part. Um, but he's wanting to pursue his NBA dream. So he's going to do that. But he did get a workout, and there was interest in signing him to like a small, you know, like a, a smaller deal. Um, but I mean, that's like I was telling the the guys on Sirius a little while ago. Uh, there's a nice parachute to fall back on, you know, in the near future if basketball doesn't work out. Much like what happened with uh, Rico Gathers, even though Rico never really, like, he kind of went straight from basketball to football. Um, whereas Mark still is focused on basketball, so. Depending on how that works out, you know, um, maybe he's trying to play football here in the near future. But just, yeah, I'm just curious your thoughts on uh, what was kind of a wacky, unexpected note from this past week. Yeah, it was really interesting. And it just seems like this has been the norm for some of these Baylor basketball players. We saw Ish Wainwright do it. Yeah. We saw Rico gather. <laughs> about Ish. I mean, it's just interesting to see how that's kind of played out. You see these big frames, guys who play physical in basketball, and you want to see, you know, how does that, uh, I guess, <laughs> just move to the NFL? I mean, I, I don't know. It usually doesn't work. Rico was an interesting case. I do think that if he had... Uh, focus yeah I, I maybe think, cared I think there's a chance he could have been fine he could have maybe made a career out of it obviously it didn't work out problem was but. he was trying to launch his rap career via the NFL I know I know <laughs> yeah there was a lot a lot to that but yeah you're exactly right and it just wasn't for him but it is interesting because when you watch Mark Vidal play it's very similar as far as the ability to play physical but also the athleticism you can see it and I know a lot of people I talk to, I always feel like basketball is the most, uh, you know, it's the sport that translates the best football, in my opinion. And, and I know that's a, that might be a crazy opinion. I'm not saying it's a complete, you know, carbon copy, but I am saying a lot of the skills that you have to have in basketball, you need to have in football. Uh, the only thing missing is the physicality part to that level. Obviously, football is a little bit different physicality wise, but yeah, it's very interesting. And if Mark, I mean, had taken that opportunity, he'd probably be doing pretty well for himself. But uh, I also like the fact that he's betting on himself. He's been a basketball player through and through. And I'm curious uh, about his next steps and his next journey and if his game can actually translate to the professional game. Uh, I'm very curious by that. Yeah, he's short for the NBA. Very short um, for his position, yeah. I don't know how that's going to really work in his favor, um, no matter how scrappy or strong or whatever, um, you know, because we have seen it before. And, you know, that, that height thing, it does end up mattering. I mean, it does. And so I, I'm not really hopeful for Mark and his NBA prospects just because of, you know, size and, and things like that. Um, I'm not going to rule him out or, or doubt him or anything like that, but – uh, you know, if all else, if you know, NBA didn't work out, he's definitely got some international ball ahead of him, and so many Baylor guys have had good, nice, long careers doing that. So that's always an option for him. I mean, Ish Wainwright left basketball and came back, and he's playing international ball again. So, I mean, that's definitely something that Mark could do. But, hey, I'm all about pursuing your dreams, you know. You, you only know if you can or can't make the NBA if you try to make the NBA. So he's going to do that. And if not, he can go play in like Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or make some good money. Israel or, or well, not Israel right now. Yeah. Um, no. Yeah, uh, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. or, or you know, maybe he says, okay, before I even do that, I'm gonna go call Jerry again and see if they still have a a little bit of an interest. But yeah, definitely was not expecting Mark Vital in a Cowboys tryout to be a part of the uh, news this week. But that's in fact what happened, and um, you know, uh, that's that's pretty cool that uh, they're even considering that uh for him so anyways um interesting note there meanwhile spring sports uh, or meanwhile elsewhere basketball not a lot to talk about basketball wise the only thing really was um kim Mulkey got inducted over the yeah. weekend i don't know how much you really paid it i didn't pay attention to it at all I watched really tim duncan's but yeah, I mean, yeah yeah i'm sure you did yeah. uh spurs fan but uh i didn't really watch any of that ceremony uh kim any of it uh so I don't really have much to comment. I know she said some nice things. That's great. Um, outside of that, Nikki Collin been kind of quiet uh, ever since, you know, last week. But uh, Miriam Dowda, their former commit, 
Uh, she's going to Arkansas. So she made that known late last week. And I say that somewhat enthusiastically because I was afraid it was going to be Texas or it was going to be, um, you know, like A&M or TC. You know, TC yeah. doesn't really threaten me, but still at this point in a transition. She's and, from Arkansas, though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but still, like, right. you're committed to the Big 12 and – you know, Texas is appealing because of Vic Schaefer and you're a big uh, prospect and he's had success there. So I was just kind of looking at like, man, who would it hurt to see her go to right. potentially? And so it won't be anybody that you really worry about. It's Arkansas. They're good. They had a nice run this past year, but you're probably not going to really run into them all that much. So I was fine with that. Yeah, I I, I was fine with that, too. I, I honestly think I know that's big news, but I think the bigger news was the hiring of Sophia Young. Yeah, I was going to get the to staff. That. that. I think that definitely is something really, really cool and something that also kind of brings that Baylor family vibe with it, with mm -hmm. the hire. So I was really happy about that. I know the loss of Miriam Dowda is big, uh, but I would also say I don't think that she was going to have a huge impact on year one. And so, therefore, Nikki can still come in, have a great season, and then, of course, um, try to make that move to the recruiting side and really – uh, add some talent and you know it, it's been tough they've lost a couple players now um, and so they're definitely gonna have to rebuild a little bit and hopefully they're able to land a transfer or two to come in and help things yeah they gotta gotta do a little bit of work on that roster I mean they still got a lot of talent coming back but there's some holes to fill now but yeah Sophia Young Baylor legend uh, part of that first national championship team uh, now a member of the staff not in an on-court role um, although that could happen in the future. Yeah. Uh, but just to start off with, it's going to be behind the scenes. It's going to be player development. It's going to be working on life outside of basketball. But there's also going to be some basketball mixed in there as well. And, you know, this is like a stepping stone type of a thing as well. Like if this works, then, you know, then you take another step. And then, hey, pretty soon you, maybe we are seeing her on the bench next to Nikki Con. You know, like got to – got to uh, – I can't think of the right – like something before you – got to walk before you run. There we go. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what I'm looking at with Sophia Young and, and her start in this career at Baylor. Uh, so we will start off with player development. That will be her focus, and that's what she wanted to do. And uh, she seemed awfully happy about it. And who would have known that, uh, you know, when we talked to her like a week and a half ago, we there was nothing – attaching her to Baylor at that time that was just like a random like hey let's see what Sophia Young has to say about a coaching change because she played for Kim Mulkey obviously and uh is one of the probably you know at the very top of the most respected lady bears of all time uh so yeah she came on and she was talking like and I loved the fact that you know it's almost like people from the outside are almost more caught up or even some Baylor fans to an extent are more caught up in like the shoes to fill and the things like that but Nikki Collins seemed to give a dead gum about the expectations as far like um, you know the shoes she's walking into. She's like, I, I know, I, I I get it. Like Kim was good, and I I realize that. Um, but Sophia Young kind of had that attitude as well of like, yeah, Kim was great, but like Nikki Collins could be great too, yeah. or you know whatever. So I really enjoyed her attitude. And then yeah, sure enough, a few days later she's joining the staff. So pretty cool how that happened. Yeah, and also I do have to mention they also lost Chrislyn Carr. Um, the transfer from Texas Tech. She's going to Syracuse. Yeah, okay. um, so that's that's another big, big loss. Obviously, she had 18 points per game at Tech. So I mm -hmm. uh, thought I'd bring that up as well. I wanted to actually ask you this question because I've seen it talked about a lot on the board and it kind of goes into, you know, Nikki could be great too. We don't know yet. Um, and I just think it's just crazy that people have this expectation for this team next year. But essentially, people are saying it's Final Four or bust oh, for this up. team. And and for Shut me, up. for me, I, I laugh at that because um, they didn't make the final four this year. I know. Yeah, they didn't make the final four this year. So how exactly. is it final four bust for Nikki Collin in year one? Well, Get and, the hell out of here! And how many did Kim made four in twenty one years or five? Um, it's four what, or five. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, something in like twenty one years. Yeah. And so now Nikki's supposed. I, for me, I think my expectation is you make it out of the first weekend. You had a very good year. Everything after that is just gravy on top, in my opinion. I know this team's good coming back. They also lose a lot. They also have a coaching change. They still have some things that they're going to have to work out. But to expect this team to be Final Four bound when I mean, we don't even know if they were going to be Final Four bound with Kim Mulkey here is just absurd to me. Yeah, okay, I don't know. That That's either a troll 
No, uh, I mean it's a lot. There's a lot of opinions. What on are y'all? What seen. are you talking? Yeah. Like I, I haven't seen this, so this is all brand new information yeah. to me. It's been a while. It's been like that too. I've just kind of avoided Kim talk lately. I just I'm, I'm over women's basketball yeah. talk for the most part. So I've kind of avoid like, I just didn't want to see it anymore. Like right. the bickering and the who made the decision and the you know blah 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 like i had to step away from it for a while because to me i'm the type of person man i'm not i don't like take a blowtorch to a bridge although i don't mind doing that and i know that's not good life advice but i don't care like that's just how i live my life um i have no problem cutting people off and just being done if the the wrong line is crossed so um not that kim crossed any line with me or anything like that but it's just like okay she's gone now like that's how i am it's like a, about a week or so of grieving understandable 20 plus years and everything three national titles blah 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 blah. so appreciative so grateful so thankful can't gush enough about how great they were but like she's gone so i'm over it like i'm i, I i've done the the whole like question and everything um and as a result i've just seen a lot of the bickering and the back and forth and like who said what and macros this and all this other stupid stuff like i just didn't want to see it anymore so I missed this conversation. I don't know what y'all are smoking that you think that it's Final Four or bust next year, but I don't even think you put those expectations on Kim every single year. So how are you putting them on a first-year head coach who's coming in and doesn't even have her whole roster set right now? That's ridiculous. That just sounds like people hoping for her to fail is what it sounds yeah. like, uh, which would not be uh, a total surprise with this fan base because at times we have seen that there are often uh, small – Groups of people that choose to pick coach over university a lot of times. And, hey, sometimes you're absolutely right in doing so. Um, and, you know, I get the love for Kim, but to say, like, Nikki Collin has any type of Final Four pressure on her shoulders is just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, yeah, so, I, I thought so, too. I thought I would get your opinion on it because well, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about it. I even think – I think Drake and JD might have been saying the lead eight or bust as well. So I think there's a lot of differing opinions on how – far this team should go i mean i'll, so I'll say like yeah at least sweet, sweet 16, 16 right that's where okay I'm at. Yeah. but like that's a first year head coach and i don't uh, care how easy the road was for kim for all those years she also did that over 20 years yeah, like yeah nikki collins coming from the WNBA, and no she's not being hired to take a massive step back in any way shape or form but I'm it's, gonna let her breathe a little yeah. bit before I start to like put expectations on her shoulders like that. It's just super interesting to see kind of the different. I know some people are doing it in spite, right, but other right. people I think are, are just you know this and I, should be the expectation. Well, okay, you know? and and that is understandable. But like again, even Kim didn't meet the final four right, every year expectation. Right. So if you want to say a lead eight or bus next year, I think that's like I'm saying sweet sixteen Same. bare minimum. Like, if I have to raise my expectations, I'll go Elite Eight would be great. But I'm not exceeding that no. in any way, shape, or form because I have no idea what they're even going to – they're learning a new system offensively. Like, it's not – okay. And I so. need to see the final roster. Too. Right, that's yeah, other, like the roster's the not even, even done. So, like, tell me this. If they lose, like, three more players, are oh. people going to still be saying, like, yeah. she's got to go to the final four? Or, <laughs> okay, well, like, well, half yeah, the team's some missing. Will. Some will be saying. Uh, well, okay, and again, <laughs> yeah. those are the people that are rooting for her to fail right. already, and, and which is sad, but – um, yeah, anyways, uh, and I missed the Chris and Carr note. I, I guess I, that just went past me, but yeah. Syracuse for her. I think uh, she, I think her sister goes there. I think there's a connection okay. there for why she's just made that decision. Okay. I mean, that's not a, it's not great. It's also not a killer, but right. still, yeah, you're, you're not trying to like really lose too many people at this point. But, uh, yeah, I just, I thought it was interesting. Marion Dada picked Arkansas, her home school. So, um, that was whatever to see. Um, you know, outside of that, um, basketball wise, men, not much going on, women, not much going on. So it's really the spring sports and, uh, men's tennis is in, uh, some fun territory, uh, with the elite eight round, uh, now, uh, part of, uh, the calendar year for Baylor in men's tennis and been a banner year could get even better if they can win a couple more times. Uh, so Michael Woodson, Gets the interim tag taken off. As Mac Rhodes let us know last week, that actually like really unofficially happened before they even won the Big 12 tournament title. Um, but that was official last week. And, you know, they proceed to go on and um, go win some more, Grayson. So 
I know you're a big men's tennis fan. Uh, they're able to take care of business this past weekend, and now they've got a very familiar foe that's awaiting them in the uh, round of eight. Yep, they take on TCU. They're the seven seed. They'll play on Thursday at 1 p.m. Um, and these two teams have played three times during this season. Of course, they, they also had the indoor part, which I'm counting. Uh, TCU beat Baylor uh, 4-1 in the indoor. Obviously, teams have changed a little bit since then. Um, and obviously, things change when you go outdoor as well. So uh, they lost the first matchup against TCU in the indoor portion, uh, but they won the last two. Uh, the one at the end of the season, they beat TCU 5-2. to two. Uh, that was the last regular season matchup of the year that allowed Baylor to tie for the Big 12 championship. And then, of course, in the Big 12 tournament, uh, they had a close one with TCU and beat them 4-3. And it's just going to be, I think this is going to be an absolute dogfight. I, I really do, just like that Big 12 tournament one uh, was. I think Baylor should win, um, but I, I think it's going to be a heck of a matchup. Both teams are playing really well right now. TCU... Uh, Beat Arkansas 4-0, Arizona State 4-1, Ohio State 4-1 uh, to get to this point. Baylor, on the other hand, 4-0 against AM Corpus, 4-0 against Oregon, and of course 4-1 against Ole Miss in the Sweet 16 to get to this point. So huge matchup. Um, the winner will take on the winner between Tennessee and Georgia on the top half. So, I mean, it's, it's not going to get any easier from here on, obviously, now that you've entered the Elite Eight. On the other side of the bracket, Texas is still in it. They'll take on USC uh, after USC beat Virginia. So three Big 12 teams. Uh, that's the second most of any conference. The SEC has four uh, with Florida A&M, Tennessee, and Georgia. So really good stuff from the Big 12. And I I'm just excited to see if Baylor can keep this momentum going. It's a familiar foe, which can be scary, but I also think it can be a good thing as well. So we'll see uh, how they're able to fare on Thursday. Yeah, what do you think about uh, just Michael Woodson and the success he's had this year? I mean, how, how cool is this? Year one, he gets the number two seed in the tournament. By many, they're the number one team in the nation, actually, coming into this, uh, according to ITA. So they're right there as being the best team in the country. Uh, you know he wants the cherry on top. You know, he wants to win the national championship. This whole team wants to win the national championship. But it's been a heck of a year. Uh, him being able to come in and just kind of right the ship and not just right the ship, exceed expectations. This team was picked 15th, I think, in the preseason poll. And now, I mean, they're, they're unquestionably one of the best teams in the entire country. And Baylor Tennis, still an elite program, and Michael Woodson has kept them there. Yeah, he most definitely has. So uh, the Horn Frogs up next for them and uh, should be a tough contest. Uh, we will see, though, a trip to the Final Four on the line and uh, what a tremendous run that would be uh, for them. So uh, that's going on. Uh, meanwhile, Baylor baseball, um, you know, uh, been an issue, you know, like expectations. I'm not really sure what they were for everybody, you know, quite frankly, um, but – you know, there was the start to the year, a little, eh, I don't know about this. And, you know, especially if basketball was having such success, you're like, oh, man, is baseball going to kind of bring the party down? But, no, they really haven't. And here they are, Grayson. They're uh, getting into the thick of things now, and they're very much in the mix for, you know, postseason discussion and things like that. So uh, Baylor baseball at this point, 30 and 16 uh, on the year, starting to wind down that schedule. And um, they're going to have – uh, Oklahoma coming up after dropping two out of three to Oklahoma State this past weekend. Uh, fortunately, we're able to get that win on Sunday to kind of salvage the uh, the sweep. Uh, but uh, it was a, kind of a rough weekend, at least first couple days there in Stillwater. Now it's on to uh, this Thursday, their final regular season contest of the year, final regular season series of the year before the Big 12 Championship Tournament, uh, which is less than uh, 10 days away at this point. So the Sooners this past or this upcoming weekend for Baylor baseball. Yeah, and Baylor was picked eighth in the preseason poll coming into the season, and currently they're in fifth, but it's really weird the way the standings work. I mean, if they get swept by Oklahoma, there's a chance they could finish seventh, even though they've had such a good year. I don't expect that. Obviously, Baylor gets to go home, which has been great news for this Baylor team because they're 22-4. and four. At home, they beat Oklahoma earlier this year uh, out in Round Rock, so familiar opponent already in that regard. Um, 
I, it's just it's been a, an interesting year. They're twenty two and four at home, seven and ten on the road, one and two in neutral. I would say that doesn't bode well <laughs> in postseason play, and it really doesn't. They have got to f- figure out a way to play better. Hopefully, when the Big Twelve tournament rolls around, they can get a little momentum in that direction. But you get a home series with Oklahoma, an absolute opportunity here for them to push themselves to the two seed level. I think if they sweep Oklahoma, they're getting a two seed. I think that's just, I think it's a lock. Whether they lose the first two games in the Big 12 tournament, I don't think it matters. I think it's a lock if they win these three. If they go two and one, I think they put themselves in a pretty good spot uh, still to get a two seed with a little bit of work to do in the Big 12 tournament. Obviously, you want a two seed. Obviously, you want the best two seed possible. You want to play a team like a, you know, East Carolina or Louisiana Tech is maybe a 15 or a 14 seed. The thing you don't want to do is have a really bad run, lose this series, lose the first two games in Big 12 tournament, and now all of a sudden you're heading to Fayetteville and you're in Arkansas's region, the number one team in the nation. That's the absolute last thing you want to happen if you're this Baylor team. But uh, overall, it's been a nice year. Now they just need to continue the momentum. I know it was a rough weekend. We're in some close contests. Couldn't get it done in Stillwater, which has been a place of nightmares <laughs> for this Baylor baseball team. But now they get to come back home against an Oklahoma team who they've actually had a lot of success against under uh, Coach Steve Rodriguez, and hopefully that continues this weekend. Yeah, they're going to get a need to, as you outlined, uh, or else they put themselves in some dangerous territory as far as the postseason goes. But, uh, yeah, Baylor baseball um, – you know, big series coming up this weekend. So not sure what the weather's looking like, but if you get an opportunity to get out to the ballpark, uh, last opportunity this year uh, for the most part. So uh, that is headed your way this weekend. Meanwhile, softball uh, kind of limping into the, the postseason, not even kind of. I mean, they lost six straight, went winless over three at the Big 12 tournament, um, got demolished by Oklahoma in the last game, which was, you know, not surprising. Uh, but they are still in the postseason, and they get a number two seed in the Gainesville Regional. Um, I don't think that they were sitting there watching the selection show or whatever, thinking that this was all, you know, a lock in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so uh, a little bit surprising, probably in the in the grand scheme of things. I know, or at least that, you know, uh, Glenn Moore had said that. Um, you know, there was maybe a little bit of nervousness there or whatever, but uh, Baylor softball in the Gainesville Regional, but they're going to have to get some things figured out if they want to make sure this season lasts much longer. Yeah, and the Big 12 got a lot of value in this postseason. A lot of teams made the, the tournament, and that means a lot of teams got uh, very lucky uh, with their seeding because of that, the strength of schedule that they played. Baylor sitting there at 27 and 21, um, but their region, their region's tough. I mean, first of all, you're going to Gainesville. You're probably going to have to play Florida, who is 42 and 9 on the year. That's that's the first obstacle. But other than that, you have South Alabama, who's 30 and 19, and South Florida, who's 29 and 17. So there's some good teams in this region. Unfortunately, I do not see this team getting out of this region. I I would honestly be shocked if they even. Um, I I mean, I don't even think they'll get to the last game in this region, just the way the season's trending. I expect Florida to move on. I know that's not what everyone wants to hear, but I I just have not seen it from this team this year that tells me that, oh, this team could go in and pull off a bunch of upsets and somehow make it to the Super Regional. I just, I don't see it. No, I'm expecting their season to end this weekend. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, a tough draw, but they got in the postseason. Um, You know, might have been a little, like, I think Glenn Moore said, that exactly what you said the schedule you know they didn't have any bad losses they had some nice wins and so all that played into their favor but yeah like they're they're walking into a bus all this weekend so uh, not expecting a a huge uh a huge run in the postseason for Baylor softball unfortunately um so uh there is softball is there anything else before we get to the mailbag I think that's it. Let's let's dive right into the mailbag this week. Okay, so we will start off with um, I'm, my internet completely went out. I don't know if you got have, you. Yeah, I have it. Uh, Jack and DP with the first question: When will the women's basketball staff be finalized, and what's taking so long? Uh, I don't know what your expectations were for the hiring <laughs> timeline. Um, 
and I'm not trying to be a you know smart aleck necessarily, but I like I don't know what your your timeline is. So I mean, I guess you you'd want it all done by now. I don't know. I guess she's trying to f- find the right people. That's all I can really tell you. I mean, um, they're not hired yet, so she's still searching. And yeah, I, I do wonder if this means that Nikki has had has interviewed multiple people and maybe just right. not found the right one yeah, or the maybe. right fit. And I, I think there's a lot that goes into that when you're going to a program like Baylor and you're going to a place where you want to make sure you make the right hires, but also you want to make sure that you're kind of um, making that balance, if that makes sense. So you hire Sophia Young. Great hire. You're, you're hiring mm-hmm. a Baylor alum. Would she have hired Sophia Young if she was at, you know, UConn or Kentucky I don't know you know I don't know their connection that that well but my guess would be the probably not if that makes sense so I do think that that comes into play a little bit that you have to kind of pick and choose areas where you feel like you need to get stronger at and pick and choose areas where hey maybe I don't really need that on my staff and things like that so I do think Nikki Collin is taking her time and I think that's a-okay because at the end of the day if she brings in the perfect staff doesn't matter when she made that hire yeah, and like I said, I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck. I just, I mean, it's been like less than two weeks since she yeah. was announced, and that's all I'm saying is, like, I, I don't know if if expectations are for her to, like, come in. The staff was already lined up before she even took the job kind of thing or or, or what the expectations were. So, yeah, I mean, like, if we're talking about this a month from now, then I will be certainly very worried about what's going on, but I'll give her a few more days to kind of – yeah interview and and get things in order i mean she's made a couple hires you know one in-house obviously sophia young or actually two three hires technically one already in-house and then sophia young and um tari cummings tari cummings so it's not as though there hasn't been you know stuff getting done um they've had movement yeah 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 and i expect more to come right come soon uh i do too so uh thank you for the question uh jack and dp uh appreciate it hopefully you're enjoying one of those right now yeah um, thanks jack and dp t-rex I'm, I'm skipping over some of these that are just kind of small talk uh t-rex will texas southern be a shutout victory no it won't be i, I think texas southern will get some you know they'll make a field goal or something late in the game and and although i will say after watching the the spring game I am nervous for Texas Southern because those backups for Baylor on defense don't look like the kind of dudes that are just going to be like, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're just going to soften up. I think they're going to try to really put their mark on the game, but I, I think they'll score at least three points. Yeah, probably. I mean, it's just so hard to shut people out these days, um, you know, and especially late in games. If it goes the way you expect it to, Baylor should blow them out. And there will be like third stringers in by the end of the fourth quarter. And that's typically when those guys get, oh, wait, you called my number? Um, I actually get to play. And then they get in there and you realize why they're, why they're not playing a lot. Um, you know, get walk ons, get in action and stuff like that. So we, we've seen that countless times. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, with this defense and, and the way they're set up, uh, you know, that should definitely be something people are rooting for. I think in that opening weekend mm-hmm. is rooting for a shutout. Um, and, and maybe that provides like an excitement level to the game because the opponent certainly isn't going to so maybe you know like trying to pitch a shutout in the first game will be something that uh people get riled up for thank you t-rex so uh, yankee bear how far will the following spring teams make it in their tournaments men's tennis well they're in the elite eight yep um oh man uh you know what it's been a magical year i, I think they're gonna win the national championship you t- picking them to win it all. I am, and and I will say it, it's not easy for me to make that pick. I do think Tennessee poses a huge threat, and I I think TCU poses a huge threat. But I I just there's something about this team. There just is. I think I think they're going to win it all. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say they're going to play for the national title. I don't know if I feel. I mean, look, I'm not informed enough on the tennis scene to pretend like I know what I'm talking I about mean, here. Florida would not be an easy. Yeah. Easy out. So like, I mean, I'll say they. They play for the title, and uh, I don't know if they'll win it. I mean, it'd be so awesome, though, if they won it. would be incredible. It'd be absolutely incredible. Uh, softball, I don't see them making the pass this weekend. They're done this weekend. Uh, baseball. Oh, man. First postseason weekend? I. It's been really hard for – Baylor baseball has struggled in regionals big time. Um, 
Yeah, I, you know what? You know what? I'll, I'll be a little bullish. I think they're going to close strong here. And if they don't close strong, if we see them really struggle, if they lose this series to Oklahoma, you know, go one and two in the Big 12 tournament, I might change my tune on this. But I think they'll make a super regional and then lose there. Okay. Okay. Uh, who are the most likely candidates to play right tackle and backup left tackle with the, our current roster? Uh, well, Gavin Byers currently will would probably be the starter at right tackle if the season started today i would probably go with him but there will be additions i think there will be i think there will be at the tackle position uh as far as left tackle who's going to be the backup oh that's a good question um i just realized i haven't thought about that yeah at all you know elijah ellis probably would be one that would come to mind um but i i don't know if he's ready to be entrenched as the backup um yeah i mean good he's the question first name that comes to mind yeah he's the first one that comes to mind because if you look at the rest of the roster i just don't really see guys who stand out to me as oh man he can for sure play left tackle yeah. i just i don't know that i see that um so i guess ellis gavin byers probably the starter at right tackle um you know micah mascua i still think he's more of a guard um so yeah i mean i i think you're waiting on guys to enroll and if they can add some transfers as well. So, you know, enrolling guys would be like Ryan Lingyell. Um, but he probably won't be ready year one. And Tate Williams is an interior guy. So that's exactly why the 2022 class is going to be loaded with offensive linemen, specifically three or four tackles. Uh, our former, and uh, final thing from Yankee Bear, a former men's basketball championship team had the opportunity to play overseas last summer, giving them ample chances to bond on and off the court. Does the fact the incoming team is not able to play in the world championship games in China this summer hurt their overall upside next year? I think I, I think it would be safe to say it doesn't help their upside I, yeah. I, because you're not getting the experience, and this is a team that probably needed it more than last year's team to be honest because they got to play a whole year together uh before going on you know the the tour of course in europe um yeah i i, I think it hurts some but i'm not gonna say that it completely keeps them from reaching their upside i still think they can get there but it may take time during the season yeah it doesn't prevent them from winning a national title again it's just you know maybe they're not as uh, bonded or close knit or what have you as they were, you know, for a lot of last year. Um, maybe but, start slower. Too. Yeah, I yeah. mean, maybe you lose a couple extra games as a result. I don't know, but no, it doesn't prevent you from winning what you won the last time around. Uh, but interesting perspective, interesting question. Thank you, Yankee Bear, as always for the uh, for the questions each week. Uh, Rufus Gee. Um, Will Kansas be a shutout victory? That was in response to the will Texas Southern be a shutout victory. I'd say no on them too. Um, no, I, I definitely don't think it will yeah. be. They're going to Kansas. Kansas will score. A, a, they'll, they'll probably score seven, maybe ten points. Uh, Matt in D.C., any new transfers Baylor football gets, they'll want them in summer session. One for offseason classes starting in June. How many official enrollments are expected in the next two weeks? Hashtag win by one. Thank you, Matt in D.C. Yeah. Of course they would want them on campus for summer session one that is the goal um for sure but i also don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility if baylor were to take a guy in early june um and get them in classes still there, there's a way to make that work but yes overall your premise is correct in the next 11 days 12 days whatever um, baylor would like to have all their transfers enrolled and that means you don't have a lot of time to go out and try to make um to to add additions and get guys on campus um i think in the next two weeks i think they'll add i think they'll get two more two enrollments uh yeah i'll go with two all right uh so two offensive line additions grayson's calling it uh here in the next couple weeks uh all right appreciate that question uh let's see here bear love 80 um Rusty Shack was ask, asking about the podcast. Is Rusty new to the website? No, no. I don't, let's see how many posts. Rusty has, oh, only 37 posts, okay. January 29th. So, yeah, somewhat. Okay, yeah, actually joined in January but of 2021. Rusty, Rusty's asked me a lot of recruiting questions. Okay. So, What's sad up, he didn't Rusty? ask me one on this one, though. For some reason, when I hear the name Rusty, think of a kid I went to school with back in the day. <laughs> 
don't know what happened to him, Rusty Spar. And I also think of uh, Brad Pitt was Rusty in the Ocean's Eleven mm. franchise. Um, for some reason, go. I don't know why that pops into <laughs> my head, but it it just it just did. So, shout out to uh, Rusty Shack on Sikkim 365. Um, let's see here, Bear Love 89. Uh, what team is a good comp? Or and to answer Rusty's question, and just for anybody that maybe ran, I mean, obviously you hear or listen to this podcast, you know when it's on, sort of, kind of. But uh, we record every Tuesday morning, and then we are playing by Tuesday afternoon be- uh, before uh, or in between um, Drake and JD, and then uh, myself, Paul, and Smokey with Sikkim Three Sixty Five Radio. So that's uh, each Tuesday. And then, like, periodically on the app uh, throughout the following yeah, days. It plays a lot of the week from yeah. 2 to 3. It plays at other times as well. So you can listen there. If you go to YouTube on the playlist, you can also go find it under the BearCast tab as well. That's where all the show uh, the shows will be. And we're also working on getting it on back on iTunes. It just has been a little bit of a little iTunes bit of tricky. iTunes sucks. Yeah. Um, it's, been, it's been tricky to make sure it's up there every week. I... I Used to use iTunes for all my podcasts, and I kind of started getting away from that because mm-hmm. it's just they have problems a little bit too often here lately. And I, I know for for people uploading, there there seems to have been some issues. Like yeah. we're not the only ones having an issue getting podcasts uploaded to Apple. So that's not always a the podcaster. That's the that's the parent company, or, you know, that's in charge of all that. So yeah, Apple's kind of kind of uh needing to step their game up a little bit but hey there's always spotify there's youtube there's uh, stitcher there's stitcher lot, there's yeah. there's all sorts of options out there for you if the apple link isn't working but uh wanted to make mention of that just for anybody else who might have had a similar question and uh bear love 89 what team is a good comp for the new offensive passing concepts other than byu yeah i was trying to think about this and it was really um difficult for me to come up with a simple solution um obviously they run the wide zone in the running game which uh, is a little bit different than the passing game I can tell you the overall goal is to run the football and be able to take shots deep and also be able to hit on short passes as well that lead to big gains through motion and different things like that so you're gonna see this team run play action you're gonna see this team roll the quarterback out you're gonna see this team do a lot of very variants in their offense so my answer to this is actually a a team that i wouldn't say is the most offensive prolific team but i think it's the closest that i can uh give based on the coaches and, and different things like that so aaron Roderick, jeff grimes at byu their offense was very similar to what utah was running in 2019 because Aaron Roderick was from there that's kind of where he got his start then at BYU he was kind of the quote-unquote passing game coordinator uh, for BYU and so a lot of his concepts come from Andy Ludwig uh, at Utah and so I I do think that those are some similarities if you go see 2019 Utah you're going to see a team uh, that was pretty good uh, with Tyler Huntley at quarterback he was throwing it um, his completion was, I think, 10.3 yards per attempt. Zach Wilson was up to 12.6 last year, but it's that same concept of um, taking shots deep. Your yards per attempt are very high in the offense because you want to take the top off the defense, um, and it also means that you're going to see a lot of guys running open, I think, especially if you're able to run the football, which is what happened a year ago for this team. So I would say Utah 2019 is the closest I could give, even though their statistical numbers passing-wise are not close to Zach Wilson's. Uh, it still is similar in that regard. What is running the football? I've never, I know, never right? heard of that. I know. What, what, is, what is running the ball? If you can get some – what is blocking? Yeah. What is, what is blocking? Um, yeah, so that's that's a great answer, and, and hopefully that's uh, that's what you were looking for with the, the question. Um, and that will do it for the mailbag this week. I uh, do appreciate everybody uh, who asked questions this week. Jack and DP, uh, Doc Crow, B. Bear and Ark, uh, let's see, T-Rex, Yankee Bear, Rufus, Matt, Rusty, and Bear Love. We appreciate you uh, for all being a part of the mailbag uh, this week in some form or fashion. And, um, yeah, a lot going on, man. Uh, what's kind of up next on the recruiting calendar? 
Is there yeah. any camps or anything like that coming up soon? I mean, June's about to be pretty crazy uh, because June's going to be the official visit. So that's kind of where ev- – that's what everyone's waiting for, to be honest. Uh, camp season will also start for Baylor coming up the first week of June. Uh, everybody's having camps in the month of June. I mean, they're just trying to get guys on campus so they can start evaluating prospects. So, yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of patiently waiting till June with camp season, official visits, um, various things like that. But right now it's just uh, slow and steady as Baylor's trying to fill out that 2022 class. Yeah, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how they do that. You know, they're halfway through at this point. Um, You know, I was wondering, too, I know there's a lot of discussion on the board this week about the NCAA. You know, Ashley had a note that, you know, there could be something coming down sooner rather than later. And, I mean, there should be. I mean, it's it's nearly the end of May already, and it's like the school year's wrapping up, and Lord knows they can't wait another, like, several months, but who knows? So, um, you know, that'll be interesting to see, and um, I'm just curious. I can't really remember in past cases, but let's say they were to come out and say, like, hey, we're docking – Two scholarships a year. That wouldn't be for starting with this class, you think, would it? Like That would be kind of late in the process to say all of a sudden, like, hey, you have two less, right? Ah, oh, man. And that's, that's, that's a deep I – I was just thinking about that the other day in terms of, like – because I saw the thread. Everybody's talking about, like, what, what might happen or whatever. And then I'm like, well, shoot, it's already halfway through the year already. Like, yeah, I would think that they would – do it for next Probably year. Probably starting or next like year, yeah. The next two years, you have yeah. uh, three scholarships reduced or something along yeah. those lines, which, again, that, that just... That'd be a crusher. That's tough but, because I you're mean, punishing current... You're punishing the current team. Let's not try to make sense of the NCAA. I know. I know. I know. Like, the first thing I can think of is that no matter if they come out with a decision today or tomorrow or, or whatever it is, like... It's been uh, five years. Yeah, there will be entire classes of people who showed up on Baylor post Art Bryles and graduated before a decision was made. I'm sorry, it's been six years. Was yeah. it May of 2015 or May of Yeah, somebody tried to cite me. I'm yeah. like, well, actually, technically, it's been uh, four and a half because when they officially opened the investigation, oh, like, and so I, okay. I don't know what the exact, it's like around five years, though. Okay. Around five years. Like, people have have come to Baylor post-scandal graduated. and graduated <laughs> and are already working at a professional job. Before the NCAA has made a decision. Yeah. It's crazy. So I'm not even going to try to predict anything, but I know that's a long thread for people who want to check it out. Um, and I was just, I was curious about the scholarship thing. Cause I'm fully expecting that. Like, I mean, something's going to happen, you know, like they're not just going to come out and say, all right, cool. We're just, nothing's, nothing's doing. So typically in things like this, they do usually dock scholarships or they, Find money or whatever. Or vacate wins. Vacate wins, which mean like they could try and strip those two Big Twelve titles. Baylor won those two Big Twelve titles, and I would refuse to take those markers down out of my I, stadium. I would too. That's um, ridiculous. A- even if you had to hide them somewhere, yeah. they should still be in the stadium somewhere. But, but I'm just expecting, like, being realistic. Okay, let's say they do lose a couple scholarships a year. I was just wondering how that would work. Um, since it's so deep in this recruiting right. process already, but well, hopefully, I mean, hopefully today we get to know or, or get some sort of inkling about when it's coming from Mac. That would be great. Yeah. I think Mac's on y'all show today, but so we'll see. Yeah, yeah. we'll see because he's. We've asked him, and you know, y'all he, ask every week. Right? We ask. We really, <laughs> yeah. you know, like people like. Why well, haven't I heard about? Yeah. Do we ask all yeah. the time, like all the time, to the point of annoyance, <laughs> like to the point of like I think it was even last week. He's like, nope, nothing's changed since the last time you asked me that, like two weeks ago. So we're asking, but you know, it's not up to any of us. If it was up to him, they would already have said something. So yeah, I mean, hopefully he's got a little light to shed. I'm not banking on it just because. Look who we're dealing with. I mean, who the heck knows, quite frankly. But, yeah, I mean, I know that he was expecting it, like, about now, if not already. So we will see on that. But that was a that was a long thread. And, um, yeah, I mean, we're in May, for goodness <laughs> sake. So uh, anything before we go here, Grayson? No, I think that's about it. Excited for these spring sports. Excited for uh, how we're trending on Sikkim 365 again. Sikkim 365 Radio, 11 to 2 up tempo, 3 to 6 with Sikkim 365 Radio. And of course, uh, the premium side. If you're not a premium subscriber, give it a try because I promise you, you're not going to want to miss out on all the recruiting coverage, football coverage, and really all the sports coverage that we have. 
Yeah, a lot of good stuff going on. We've had uh, a lot of new members over the last, you know, few weeks and uh, providing some new voices and new opinions and new fights and <laughs> <laughs> everything else in between, new friendships. So definitely encourage more and more folks to join the party. And uh, let's make it, you know, it's already the biggest, best Baylor community, but let's keep growing this thing and, and make it even more massive uh, for all of us. So I uh, do appreciate our sponsors, as always, as well, WellMed Medical Management, Burt Colch and Ford, USMD uh, Health System Dallas. Uh, thanks to Jack McKenzie for filling in this week for uh, Armstrong Sims. And um, he'll, I'm sure, rejoin us at some point. But uh, uh, Jack doing a great job for us. And uh, Grayson, that'll about do it. Uh, check out Sikkim365.com. Check out Sikkim365 Radio. If you don't see us on the Apple Podcast, look elsewhere. We're working on that. And, uh, yeah, just stay plugged in because there's plenty going on when it comes to Baylor Athletics. And that'll do it for us this week. Thanks one more time to all of our sponsors. Uh, for Grayson Grunhafer, I'm Craig Smoke. This has been the BearCast on Sikkim365.com.